The story picks up nothing short of a few months after Spider-Man Miles Morales 2. After wrapping up the chameleon's escapades and fleshing out the character of Cindy Moon aka Silk, we found ourselves back in the shoes of Peter Parker. We saw from his last appearance he has put Spider-Man on the back burner to put all of his focus into the EMF, with help from Rio who is now the new mayor of New York, taken over from Norman Osborn. Peter has been able to really expand the EMF across the city. As mentioned before, all the scientists that previously had worked with Harry before its explosion all came to work for Peter because their dream of healing the world didn't stop there. So instead, the formula of this game is going to be slightly different because Peter is currently not occupying the Spider-Man suit, the city has been left to both Miles and Cindy. And the big opening fight sequence that allows the player to gain the knowledge of the system and user interface will be done by them alone. The opening cutscene is that of Peter and Mary Jane at the EMF. Peter was showing MJ around the new facility paid for by Rio, as MJ was getting quotes from everyone there so she could spread awareness through a podcast, The New Normal. It would only be then when Peter gets a frantic call from Miles, as we can clearly tell he's in distress. Peter would ask him what was wrong as Miles asked for some help. We would transition to a couple minutes prior as we saw Miles and his friends Ganky, Haley, and Cindy at Central Park eating some ice cream together when both Miles and Cindy's spider senses went crazy. They turned to see people running in terror as Miles told Ganky to get Haley out of here. He asked Cindy if she was ready as the two started sprinting, changing into their suits along the way. As we were led into a swinging sequence, we controlled Miles. We swung through the trees in Central Park as we scoured through the city. Before long, an army of drone-like spiders swarmed around Miles as they started attacking. Miles would web them up and throw them against each other as they exploded. Cindy would ask what the hell was going on as they turned around to face in front of them, we saw a massively upscaled version of one of those spider slayers. It was tearing up the city as Miles tried to hatch a plan. He and Cindy thought if they put Miles' venom powers against it, it could weaken its structure enough for them to get a hit in. We transferred over to Cindy as we saw her trying to distract the spider slayer. She launched objects at it as she tried shooting her webs, doing everything that she possibly could to distract it. Miles eventually found his opportunity as he charged up his venom blast, lunging toward the spider slayer and frying its circuits. He called over Cindy as the two of them tried ripping out everything they could before the spider slayer threw them off. And dozens of smaller spider slayers approached them, adding another layer of difficulty to the second stage of the boss fight, as we had to fight all of them off whilst dodging the heavy attacks. Before long, we were able to continue flying to the spider slayer, as Cindy was able to rip out some of its targeting software, but it only made it the more dangerous, as the robot was now firing blind. The bullets went through buildings and toward the streets, as Miles tried webbing up the turret. Cindy would throw everything she had at the weapons, as she was able to finally destroy them. Both Cindy and Miles leaped toward the spider slayer together, charging up their powers as we saw them destroy it. It came crashing down as the two of them landed on a rooftop overlooking the battlefield. Miles was out of breath, calling it a close one. Cindy said that they did good, but it wasn't over yet, as Miles pointed out that there could be injured people down there who need our help. He got a call from Pete and asked if everything was okay and if they still needed his help. Miles said they had things under control, but if he can recalibrate the EMS data, they can use it to get the app back up online. Peter said he was on it as we saw the request start coming through. The two would then split up as we first controlled Miles, saving a civilian and taking them to the nearest hospital. Cindy would save a destroyed bus as she ripped open the doors and got everybody out safely. Pete then called back and said the software was just running the latest patch and the app should be back up in a matter of no time. Miles told him thanks as Cindy called for backup. Miles would swing over as we saw a kid stuck in one of the higher floors of the building. Miles and Cindy worked together in order to save him as he thanked them both. He said that Miles was his hero, hugging him with a passion. Miles chuckled and just told him it was part of the job as they got the kid to the ground safely as the cops and firefighters approached. The wolf got out the car along with the firefighter chief as they said they can take over from here as they thanked the spiders for their assistance. Cindy would zip away and shortly after Miles would too not before discovering a piece of that tech that attacked them. He picked it up as he left the scene, Cindy said that she had to head back. Her dad needed her as Miles said that he could handle things for now. Miles took another look at the tech as he swear he had seen it before. Soon enough, Pete called as Miles asked if he could stop by the lab. Pete said he'd be happy for him too as Miles started swinging. He soon arrived at the EMF as he changed into his street clothes. 
He met with MJ and P as he told them he had something for him to look at. They went into Peter's office as Miles placed down the tech. Pete gave it a closer inspection. He said it was similar to tech that's been used against him before, but definitely not in this order. He did a few tests on the metal that was used, claiming it to be something stronger than titanium. And to his knowledge, the only other facility in the city with access to material like vibranium or adamantium would be Smythe Industries. But as far as he's concerned, Spencer passed away a few years back. Miles said he'd check it out later. Pete told him well done for taking it out and saving all of these people. Miles said he was just doing what the OG would want him to do. Pete smiled. Miles soon got a call from Rio as he said he had to run. He thanked Pete for his help as he took the tech with him for later. MJ said she also had to go as this story wasn't going to write itself as Peter would kiss her and told her good luck. As they both left, Peter walked to the edge of his office, looking over the centre. So we saw a smile on his face. He was happy, proud. We then faded to the penthouse belonging to the Osborns. Harry was still laid unconscious in the bed, slowly dying, Norman slowly running out of options. Norman and Pete have actually been working tirelessly on a cure. Pete still wants to save his friend, and he thinks he might have something big, something that might actually work. But it's taken its time, time that they don't necessarily have. And Norman is getting more restless by the minute. We caught up with Miles as we saw him out in the city. Rio would call him as the two talked about Rio's new plans moving forward, laying down the groundwork for the heroic work that Rio is going to be doing as the new mayor. I like the fact that these games take even the side characters and give them the opportunity to do something good. However, Miles is still curious about what these spider slayers were. Our next mission was to head over to Smythe Industries, and as we started swinging, along the way we heard a new episode from Danica's podcast discussing the spider team's takedown of giant freaking spiders. It was nice to hear praise the team were getting as we approached the tower. Smythe Tower was practically a clone of Oscorp, but they were more focused on the mechanical engineering aspect, not necessarily genetics or any of the other shady stuff that Norman and Oscorp were up to. Miles arrived in a building opposite as he tried to scout the place out. We first disabled the security locks as we snuck in through an event. Miles made his way through as we heard the CEO on the phone to what he believed was Walker Sloan. The two were shouting at each other through the phone as we saw the CEO hang up in frustration. Miles watched as his assistant told him that she had set up a new meeting in the conference room. Miles saw his opportunity to hack into their database as we snuck into the CEO's office. From the plaque on the desk, we saw the building and company was now in the hands of Spencer Smythe's son, Alistair. He was a prodigy in the mechanical engineering, even beating the likes of Tony Stark, who would actually get a reference here. Miles saw plans hidden between the files related to the Spider Slayers, even bigger than the ones they faced earlier at the start of the game. There were setups that in underclosed locations across the city as Miles would have to work through them. This would set up a set of side missions and quests throughout the game. As we saw, this would actually go back all the way to Wilson Fisk, taking inspiration from the 90s animated show. Fisk may still be in prison, but he still has connections on the outside, and he's been blackmailing Alistair Smythe into creating these spider slayers to take down Spider-Man so that Fisk could finally be let free. And over the course of these side missions, Miles will put together what Fisk is up to, and somewhere among these quests, we would have a boss fight with spider slayers and even Smythe himself, as Miles would stop Fisk before he had the chance to get out. But of course, those are just some side missions and not the main story, so let's get back to that. After Miles had investigated the building, it was time to get prepared for Haley's birthday. It was tomorrow, and Miles had something big planned. The next set of missions were actually a nice little fun quest, which results in Miles having to pick up a customly made cake, balloons, and other decorations, calling back to the classic Spider-Man 2 game, where we have to get the balloon for the little kid. It is important to note though that right now, at the start of the game, Miles is the main Spider-Man of this universe, and Peter is just more on the back burner. He's not necessarily Spider-Man right now, but don't worry, it's not going to stay like that. But establishing this here in Act 1 is a very crucial part of information, 
and to save the confusion, the three spider heroes will be playable in the open world, however, this is still, most importantly, Peter's story. Second to Miles, and Silk will have her time to shine in her own standalone game, which, in my personal headcanon, would take place after this game. We go to Queens as we saw Peter getting off the train to meet with Mary Jane. The two of them walked together as we got a nice mission of the two of them together. The sun was setting, they held hands, they smiled. It was the Peter Parker that we've always wanted to see. Pete asked about MJ's podcast and she told him how great things were going. She'd finally found her way of making a difference in the world and Peter just couldn't be prouder. The two eventually made it back to Pete's house as we knew that they're both living together now. The scene just gave us a little taste of this happy life. Pete cooked dinner without burning it this time as the two of them watched TV together. This scene was very reminiscent of that one scene from Uncharted 4. Peter and MJ had the normal life that they'd always wanted, but could Peter rest? Could he live the life he always wanted, or will he still forever be pulled into the life of Spider-Man? That is the question the game needs to answer. The two had a sweet kiss as Peter admitted that he hadn't been telling MJ the entire truth. He thought about Harry every day. He doesn't know if what they're going to do is going to work, and if it doesn't, he's going to lose his best friend forever. MJ placed her hand on Peter's cheek, comforting him. She told him that he was the brightest person she knew. If anyone could come up with a cure, it was him. Pete smiled as MJ wrapped her arms around him in a lovingly warm embrace. As we faded to black, we transitioned to Cindy. She and Albert, her father, would be working on one of her projects for college as we got a down-to-earth moment with the pair. Cindy, of course, isn't going to get as much screen time as the other spiders, but we still want a story of hers to be told, and Cindy's story is about her relationship with her father. Similar to Miles, she lost a parental figure not so long ago either. And unlike Miles, Cindy is struggling to move on. She loves Rio and the fact that her dad's happy, but just because he's ready to move on doesn't mean she is. And it's taken her a long time to accept the fact that she has to move on. She openly admits it to her dad. He gets where she's coming from. He really does. But if Cindy's mum could see her right now, all the good that she's doing for the city, she'd be so proud. Cindy wishes she felt that way too, but it doesn't do anything for her. When she's out there, all she can think about is how long it'll take before she can take the suit off. It feels like a chore. Albert admits that being a hero is definitely not an easy feat. It comes with a lot of sacrifices, and losing her mum was the biggest that she'd probably ever have to make. But no matter what, she'll be with Cindy, keeping her safe, protecting her, just as he will. Cindy would smile, for the first time, realistically, in a long time as Albert helped her with the final touches of the project. The sweet moment was short-lived as she got an incoming crime alert. Albert gave her a nod of blessing as Cindy was gonna test out whether what her dad said was true or not. We cut to her suited up as she started swinging. As she did, we got a call from Miles who told her an inmate from the rafters escaped. Reports say that she is locking down Madison Avenue and is quite dangerous. Miles offered to help, but Cindy said she could handle it. Cindy took the time to upgrade her gear and explore the city as our new checkpoint finally arrived. Cindy would swing over as we saw a full-on riot down Madison Avenue. We panned up the street as we saw the chaos unfolding. Buildings caught fire, cars were tippled over and bodies were scattered all over the ground. Cindy looked on in horror and disgust. At the center of this mass destruction was Lorena Dodson, also known as the White Rabbit. Lorena was batshit insane quite frankly, and her character here will be a close counterpart of Harley Quinn from the DC Universe. She was crazy, funny, and just overall insane with an equal love of destruction. After killing her wealthy husband just for the thrill of it, she used her wealth to buy high-tech gadgets and use her love for violence as fuel to do whatever she wanted in the city. Thinking she was the Queen of New York, she stood on top of a squad car with a rocket launcher in her hands as we saw Cindy arrive. The two exchanged dialogue as Cindy said she was going to shut her down. Lorena could do nothing but laugh as she launched the rocket straight at Cindy's head. She luckily managed to dodge it, but the deflectable explosion knocked her back. Lorena threw down her empty launcher as one of the goons handed her her famous pink umbrella, which was also a stainless steel crowbar. 
This fight was unique in the fact that the entire street was decked out with goons from every angle, meaning Cindy had to work her way through like an obstacle course. She was surrounded by goon after goon as she pushed her way forward. We saw Cindy's unique fighting style, she wasted no time at all. She finally got through to Lorena as she just laughed hysterically. She threw down an EMP as Cindy's powers were disabled. This boss fight began as we saw the player had nothing but our fists. The fight stage began with us focusing on dodging the crowbar attacks as well as putting up with Lorena's terrible jokes and quips. Using skill and perfect timing, we were able to get the hits in in time as we got back our powers. Lorena broke her weapon into two as the second stage became about parrying these attacks in time as they became more and more frequent. Now with the help of our webs, it wouldn't be long before we defeated the white rabbit. Cindy webbed her up, throwing away her weapon, and the cops moved in. Lorena was rightfully pissed as she said she wasn't going back to prison. Cindy snidely remarked at her and told her not to break out this time. As Lorena was taken away, Cindy would zip up to the nearest vantage point. We panned across the city in a big truck and shot as we arrived at Miles. He'd be at home getting ready for Haley's party as Rio helped him. Together, they put up balloons and decorations as we saw Miles write out a card with all of his feelings for Haley, along with a present. But first, there was something else he had planned. We all told Miles good luck as we cut to the center of Harlem. As the night grew closer and dusk set in, we saw Miles waiting at the park, dressed all dapper with a bouquet of roses. Before long, we saw Haley arrive and we saw her smiling from afar. Miles, as awkward as he was, stood there and smiled back as he handed the roses. He said she looked beautiful as he held out his arm. She would link with his as the two started walking. Miles dropped hints about the night that he had planned as we saw the two of them sit on a bench. Miles said that he just wanted to thank her for everything. He really means it. She's the rock that keeps him grounded and without her he'd definitely suck at this double life thing. Haley showed Miles how much she appreciated that as we saw Miles look up to the sky. Haley also did shortly after as we saw the fireworks lighting up everything. Haley gasped in joy and excitement as the two of them just stared at the beautiful colours. They held hands as Miles handed her the card. But he told her not to open it yet. Along with that was a gift. Haley unwrapped it, we saw a bunch of different coloured spray paints. She looked confused at Miles. He told her there was another part to it. If she'd follow him. Turns out Miles had saved enough cash to buy a private wall in the park. He told Haley that it was for her to express her artwork. She signed to Miles that it was beautiful and she was really thankful. Miles grabbed one of those cans and handed it to Haley as she signed for him saying that she wanted his help. He said he was terrible at heart. They both laughed as she handed him a can. The two painted together. It was a sweet moment as the moon was full. They both leaned in and kissed one another. A wonderful scene that warmed our hearts. We soon transitioned back to Peter at the EMF later that night, as a couple of other scientists had gone home. Peter was waiting there for a very important visitor. He was knee deep in research of Harry's illness, trying to find ways to cure it using every possible resource at his disposal. Soon enough though, Pete got a call. He was here. Pete opened the door up as we saw Dr. Kurt Connors. Pete thanked Kurt for coming. No matter what had happened, he still cared about Harry. He felt partially responsible for bonding him with a symbiote, as he wanted to amend his mistakes. Peter invited him into the center, as Kurt said things were looking great over here, maybe even better than before. Pete said there were always a spot available for him if he decided to come and work here. Kurt appreciated the offer, but said his days of science were behind him. There was just one last thing he needed to amend before he quit. It was been known to Kurt that Peter was Spider-Man due to the last game. He invited Kurt into his research station in the lab as we saw the two of them tried to brainstorm some ideas. They wondered why the symbiote worked. It was a healing agent that attacked any foreign diseases in the cells in order to maintain a healthy bond, which is what allowed Harry to become immune to the disease. Pete then had an idea, but he knew it would be risky. Back when everything went down and Lee used his power to corrupt the symbiote, they removed the parts of it that made it consumable. They removed the hive mind. Peter transformed into the anti-venom suit as he asked her if it would be possible to give this to Harry. If they can bond it to the suit, they can heal him the way it did before, only this time, all the evil parts are gone. 
Kurt was cautious, looking through their research though, he said it was probably their best option. Transforming back, Peter said that this would work. We can save Harry. Kurt said it would take time. We need to extract the symbiote without damaging it. It looks like the symbiote this time around is bonded at the subcellular level. However, the symbiote before was not. We can't afford to let the symbiote become corrupt. With the rock destroyed though, they do have a better chance. Peter couldn't stop smiling. Kurt told him not to get his hopes up, but it looks like Pete already had. Kurt said he needed to go and get some of his equipment and bring it here. If they work together, they can get the symbiote off of Peter and give it to Harry. If the bonding process works, Harry will be cured. Peter hugged Kurt and told him thank you. Kurt said they still had a lot of work to do. He told him he'd be back in the morning and they can begin the process. As Kurt left, Peter would call Norman. He told him the good news. They might have found a cure. But Norman was drained. He was exhausted. He was out of options. Each passing day, Harry was getting worse. He told Pete whatever he was doing, he needed to hurry. Pete said they were going to work as fast as they can. Peter hung up as he took a moment to breathe. This may be their last option. We cut back to Miles out on patrol in the city. He caught up with Haley on the phone as she thanked him for last night. She really appreciated all that he did for her. Miles said that she deserved it. She's always there for him when he needs her the most. And he was just trying to give her something back. Haley said she would have to go as Miles would explore the city, gathering upgrades when he got a call from Martin Lee. Miles asked if everything was okay as Lee asked Miles if he'd come and meet him at feast at some point. He had something to share with him. The checkpoint then appeared on the map as we swung over. Shortly after, Miles arrived changing into his street clothes as he entered the building. The place was crowded with sheltered people as Miles caught up with Gloria. The two exchanged some dialogue before Lee intervened. He had now shaven off his beard as he cut his hair, looking closer to his regular self from the first game as he asked Miles to come with him. Miles said bye to Gloria as he followed Lee through to the main area. Miles asked what was going on, but before Lee could answer, Miles set his eyes on the big shrine that had been built for Jefferson Davis. Miles stared at it for just a second as Lee told Miles he wanted to show him that he was sorry. He knows he'll never be forgiven. He doesn't want to. He knows what he did was wrong, but wanted Miles to know that he was trying to change. Miles said that this was really, really nice. It was special. He would shake Lee's hand. He told him he was back where he belonged, helping the people of New York. Lee smiled. He said it was good to be back, as Miles received a call. Miles said he had to run as he thanked Lee once again. Lee had a smile on his face. He was happy, relieved, as we cut back to Miles suited up. Marco was on the other end of the phone as he told Miles he thinks Kimia is in trouble. He feels his past is beginning to catch up with him and Miles told him to explain what had happened. Marco said he received a call from his wife. She cried and screamed for help. Marco said Spider-Man was the only person he could trust. He told Marco he could handle this. He definitely felt the pressure knowing the young girl was in trouble, but he knew he had to save her. Along the way, swinging Marco would bring Miles up to speed on what was going on. Marco says that back in the day, before he became this, he made a lot of enemies. He ripped people off. He was a crook. They've been tracking me for years. I tried to move to get away from them, but I think they've caught up to me. Miles asked who it was that was after him. Marco said they had gone by many different names in the past. The one that he can think of the most when he was with them was the Enforcers. He told Miles to be careful. There were more than one and... They were all strong. Miles told Marco to hang tight. He was going to get back his daughter. Miles soon arrived at an old shipyard surrounded by goons as we stealthily tucked them all down. We made it inside the building as Miles sneaked around looking for Kimia. As Miles progressed through the warehouse, he eventually found Kimia. She was tied up. The enforcers were holding a hostage as the place was crawling with guards. We first had to take them down, and after we did, it led us to our next boss fight of the game. There were three enforcers, so three different boss fights. The first one being with Montana. His lasso was able to grab a hold of Miles, which kind of shook up the gameplay. Miles eventually stopped him as Ox took over. He was big, brutish, almost like Fisk, as Miles had to use a different technique. We heard Kimia screaming for help as Fancy Dan told her to shut it. Enraged, Miles hit Ox with an electric punch, which completely knocked him unconscious. Dan was the only one that was left, and he was fast. 
He shot Miles back as he grabbed Kimir and made a run for it. Miles shouted in frustration as we chased Dan through the building. We had no webs, all we had was our parkour and traversal as we were led through a giant obstacle course. Finally, Miles caught up with him as he threw Dan to the ground. He saved Kimia in a slow motion shot as he told her to run and hide. We were led into the final fight, however this one became easier as he was already pretty worn down. Miles prevailed as we would web up all three of them together for the cops as Miles would untie Kimia's wrist as he told her to hang on tight. Miles would swing Kimia back to her home as she was reunited with her mother. She thanked Spider-Man for his help as Kimia smiled, saying that Miles was a hero. She went inside where it was safe and warm as we saw Miles perched on a roof overlooking the city. He called to tell Marco he got her back safely as he said he owed him a debt. He was eternally grateful. Miles said it was okay. He was just glad that Marco was back and the Sandman was behind him. Marco assured him that it was, and with the spider's help and those lawyer friends of theirs, he got a reduced sentence. He's going to be out in the next few months so he can finally be with his daughter and live a normal life. Miles said it sounded like a great idea. Marco had to go as Miles found himself pretty beat. He decided to take the subway home. The next morning, we saw Peter nervous at home. MJ was about to go. She stopped and tried comforting him. Peter said that this might be their last chance. If it doesn't work, he doesn't know what he's going to do. MJ said that she had faith. She believes that they're going to find this cure. It's going to work. She hugged him. She told him she had to run. But she was always here for him. Peter leant on the sink as he stared into the mirror, thinking about all the times that he and Harry had spent together. Back at the EMF, we saw Peter setting everything up, over-criticizing every last little detail. Kurt soon arrived with the rest of his equipment as he asked Peter if he was ready to do this. He said he was as ready as he could be. Kurt said he did some more research last night. The symbiote, when first bonded to Harry, healed him. It was in a stage before it was corrupted. If they're right about this specific symbiote, they can essentially give back Harry the symbiote to that stage and for it to be permanent. Peter said, let's get this thing off so they can run some tests. Peter would stand in the chamber Kirk created as Peter closed his eyes. He focused on the mind of the symbiote as minutes later, we saw it begin to peel away. The system was working. It slowly retracted from Peter's body as Kurt was able to contain it inside a small compartment. As Peter stepped outside the chamber, Kurt was fascinated by his DNA. He was shocked. Peter asked what it was as Kurt told him that the suit seemed to have entangled with Peter's spider abilities. It was able to cure anything, heal anything. And all the corruption, it, it was gone. Peter couldn't stop smiling. Is it ready? Kurt said he'd like to run a couple more checks before they move forward. Peter would ask how long it would take. Kurt said a couple hours at most. Peter was growing impatient, but he trusted the dog. But as Peter took a moment, he reflected. He was getting used to being symbioteless. He looked up to see that yet again, the raft was in full lockdown. Explosions, gunfire. It was worse than it ever has been before. Pete tried calling Miles, but there was no response. We saw Peter seriously consider it for a second as he closed his eyes, and he sighed. He walked over to Kurt and said he'd be back in a couple of hours. After you've run your checks on the symbiote, keep it safe and secure. The moment I'm back, we're bringing it to Harry. Pete said he was putting the lab in lockdown. He stared back at the TV and said he couldn't believe he was doing this again. After so many months in retirement, Pete was left with no other option than to redon the suit one more time as we were finally able to play as Pete as Spider-Man. Our checkpoint told us to head over to the raft as we could see even from here the place was in absolute chaos. As Peter made it over, he saw the cops and firefighters outside barely able to get in. Peter arrived and told them to hang here until it was safe as the wolf looked at Peter and told him to hurry. The entire system was offline. That means every prisoner in there can walk straight out if they wanted to. We zoomed in on Peter's lens as there was only one name on his mind. He zipped upward and went in through an air vent as he crawled around, trying to make it through the prison. All the while, Peter was constantly repeating the worries of a certain someone. As he looked down below the grate, there were some strange new mercenaries he hadn't seen before, going in with guns and ripping off the locks of all the cells. Pete would dive down as it led to a huge fight sequence. Dozens upon dozens of mercs attacked as Peter was feeling pretty vulnerable without the symbiote. 
but said he could get used to it. Before long, Peter was able to take all the missionaries down as he looked around. The place was eerily quiet except for the alarm. Peter heard a familiar laughter as Pete tried looking deeper. At the end of the corridor, a cell door opened as we saw one man walk straight out. Peter looked for curiously as we saw the man turn around to face Peter. He stopped dead in his tracks. Dr. Octavius? Ox smiled as Peter's spider sense churned. The entire roof exploded as more mercs lowered down. Peter got busy fighting them, which gave Otto an opportunity to escape. Pete chased after him, zipping to the roof as we saw a giant helicopter with a mounted turret. It shot at Peter constantly as a bullet went straight through his arm. Otto made it to the top as he smirked at Peter. The helicopter flew out of frame as Peter paused for a moment. He gulped out fear. Otto was back. Peter was terrified of what might happen next. We faded back to the lab as Kurt was doing the final tests. Peter walked in shortly after, blood pouring from his arm as Kurt asked if he was okay. He immediately went over to aid Peter as he told Kurt that Otto had escaped. Peter was just shell-shocked. Kurt told him not to worry. Pete said the last time he did that, he ended up losing someone he cared about. Someone close to him. Kurt told him that last time he didn't have Miles or Cindy. This time, whatever Doc's planning, it'll be different. He's sure of it. In other news... The symbiote was ready to be transferred. This gave Peter a flicker of hope. He hugged Kurt and he couldn't stop saying thank you. Kurt said it was okay. After his wife left and took his son, Harry almost became that son to him. He cares just as much as Peter does. And if this cure works, then he knows it was all worth it. Peter would ask Kurt if he ever thought about talking to Martha or to Billy. Kurt said he thought about it every day. Every day, he'd wonder what it'd be like to wake up next to her, to watch my son play. Peter said he was sorry. He, he truly was. Maybe after this, you can talk to them. Kurt wishes he could, but he wouldn't want to ruin their lives more than he already has. Pete stood up. You're a changed man, Kurt. You've put the lizard behind you. And I know everything about prosthetics, the neural interface. I worked with Otto for years. I could develop an arm for you. Kurt smiled. He thanked him. He said his days of testing on himself were over. All he cares about right now, though, is getting this to Harry before it was too late. Kurt to Miles as he was on the phone to Pete. He was in disbelief. Ock was back. Pete said he tried to stop him, but he slipped straight through his fingers. Miles asked if Peter was back for good. He told Miles it was just until Otto was back behind bars. But... He found a cure for Harry. Him and Connors are about to take it to him. I need you to look for Otto. Call me back when you find some leads. Miles said he was on it. He figured he'd start by checking out Otto's lab as we would swing on over. We saw the place was completely boarded up. Miles would send in the spider ball as he looked around the lab for clues. Rio called as she heard the news about Otto. Miles said he was looking for him right now, but so far he hasn't gotten anything. Rio told Miles to keep himself safe, and she said that she had to go. As Miles' spider bot looked around the lab, we saw some writing on whiteboards, equipment abandoned and scattered all over the place. Miles took pictures of everything he could, as we saw some boxes from the Hexus Corporation. Inside was a bunch of equipment, as Miles said he should probably check there out next. As we started swinging through, Miles got a call from Ganky, who said there was a residential break in near him. Miles said he needed to check out the Hexus, but Ganky said it sounded urgent. Miles decided to head to the residential as he called up Cindy and told her to head over to Nexus. We would switch over to Cindy as we caught her swinging. Miles would give her the coordinates and details as she asked what she was looking for. Miles said that it looks like Ock was buying equipment from them, and the shipment dates don't match up with the time that he went to jail. He told her to check out the database for any information or locations that the shipments were bought from, but he told her to be careful. Ock was smart. He knew that this wouldn't be easy. As Cindy soon arrived at the company, Cindy stated ever since Oscorp there's been a rise of companies like this. First Roxxon and Alchemax, now this. As Cindy made her way through, we got a glimpse into the inside of the company, similar to that opening scene from Edge of Time. The place was filled with drones, artificial bots, weapons, experiments. Cindy had no idea what to think. 
She made her way to the main control room as we saw her downloading all the servers. There were multiple shipments to someone named Elliot Tolliver. She couldn't find record of purchases before or after the dates that Miles had found. We know the name as Cindy said she'd look into it. She noticed someone was coming as she zipped up to the air vent before escaping in time. She called up Miles to tell him what she had found. Miles recited the name saying that something sounded off as he told her he'd take a look at it. We would switch back over to Miles as he finished up at the residential break-in. Cindy told Miles to be careful and she'd let him know if she found anything else. Miles took a minute. Okay, we've got a name, some dates, and that's about it. They needed more concrete information. And thinking he was out of options, he then got a call from Lee. He said he saw the news. Miles was worried. He asked if Lee knew anything. Did Doc ever mention when they worked together what his plan would be? Lee said Otto was a very secretive man. No one knew what he was up to. We just followed along. Miles said he had a name for him if he wanted to look into it. Lee said he could ask around, see what he could find, as Ma said he should probably head home to regroup. Ma probably needs me to help with the dinner anyway. As dust drew in, we cut to Peter and Kurt as they were ready to transport the symbiotes. Osborne had sent over a cavalry to get it there safely, as Pete said it was best if they went with it to assure that it got there safely. Kurt told him it was a good idea as they got in the back. The Oscorp guards got the shipment going, but Peter was nervous. Kurt said that this was going to work. Harry would be back to his old self in no time. This helped reassure Peter. He was about to reply when his spider sense soon went crazy. He looked around. At first, there was nothing. Peter really couldn't locate the danger until Kurt asked what was going on. He asked multiple times. We heard the truck thud multiple times as Peter could not find out what was happening. He was confused, scared. We had a massive explosion as Peter looked out the window to see the cavalry under attack. He told Kurt to protect the symbiote at all costs. He ripped off his shirt, revealing the suit underneath as he pulled down his mask and swung up to the roof. Things were getting crazy. The cavalry was swarmed by weaponized vehicles as they were mowing down Oscorp guards. Peter would try to stop them. We took control as we had to stop these. Peter was becoming more and more irritated as he got corners on the line. He said it was safe for now, just keep taking them out. Peter would get to work as he ripped off the turrets and crashed the vehicles. His spider sense just kept flashing as Peter turned backward. We saw a mercenary wielding a rocket launcher as they shot it directly at Peter. He tried to dodge but the rocket wasn't actually aimed at him. He shouted no as the rocket hit the front of the truck, exploding it. Kurt from the inside was extremely hurt as he shouted out in pain. The symbiote was still intact, but he called out for Peter, shouting for help. The door was then ripped off the hinges as Kurt told Peter to get the cure. But as he turned around, it wasn't Peter. Four mechanical arms ripped open the rest of the debris from the truck as we saw Dr. Octopus. He was laughing hysterically as he shared his distaste for Connors and his work. He told Otto not to do this. He shot his arms straight past Kurt as he grabbed the symbiote. Kurt told Otto that Harry Osborn needed that he was going to die. Otto just laughed as he knocked Kurt out. Suddenly, Peter shot up as he looked around and he looked dead into Otto's eyes. He shouted and told him to give that back. Otto laughed and said that this was just the beginning. Peter lunged toward him as Otto wiped the floor with Peter. He was left broken, bruised, alone as Otto held up the symbiote. Just one more little chore. Otto would leave the scene as he saw the utter destruction that he had caused. Peter was lifeless on the ground. We saw Kurt wake up and make it outside. We saw Peter on the ground as he tried to wake him up. We would call the ambulance as we saw the horrified look on his face. We would cut to Norman as Kurt told him what had happened. Norman was absolutely furious. He broke and smashed his phone on the ground. His assistant soon walked in and asked if everything was okay. Norman snapped. He knew what Otto was doing. Norman may have made enemies, made mistakes, but this was by far one of his worst. Otto was getting his revenge by the best way he knew how, by attacking Norman's heart. Harry's gonna die if they don't get that treatment back. He didn't trust the spiders as Norman was so pissed off. He told his assistant to go get the G-serum ready. That was their last resort. His assistant asked about the cure. He said it wasn't for Harry, don't be stupid. He snapped and told her to get it now or she was fired. 
she said right away. Norman clenched his fist in anger as we cut to the hospital. Kurt would be treating Peter as he was going to be okay. He just needed time to rest. MJ soon arrived as she immediately hugged Peter in relief. Peter said he messed up badly. Otto has the symbiote. If we don't get it back to her, he's going to die. MJ said she told Miles and Cindy to go check it out. Peter got upset. He was at a loss. He had no idea what to do. MJ held his hand tightly and told him they were going to get that suit back. Harry was going to be just fine. Peter said he didn't know if that was true. He was scared. Miles arrived shortly after as we saw things had been escalated to the max. We transitioned to Cindy as we saw the player took a breather from that bombshell. Cindy had been a few leads away as we saw her trying to chase them all down. Soon enough, she traced the name to an old museum in the city. It was abandoned and cleared out a few decades ago, so Cindy got to work. As she swept through the museum, we picked up on some clues throughout, as this Dr. Elliot person must have been Otto's alias, as we could clearly see the same level of equipment Otto had belonging to that name. Cindy was made aware of Otto and his master at covering his tracks, so Cindy was very skeptical. Otto was definitely smart, but Cindy thought she could find some kind of flaw. And as she dug deeper, we tapped into Cindy's scientific knowledge as we saw her manage to pit some coordinates together. Suddenly, her spider sense alerted her as we saw an army of robotic soldier drones bust through the wall. Similar designs from what we saw at Hexus. We knew the company had supplied to Otto in the past, so it looks like Hexus has now supplied him with these drones. Cindy would have to fight them all off as she would break down some of their tech. With partial coordinates she found, she is able to reverse engineer the tech and pinpoint an exact location, as she would call Miles and she said that she had a real lead. We cut back to the hospital as Peter said they had to find Otto. MJ said he was in no state. Miles held him up. He told her that they had no other option. Harry could die at any second. We're just lucky he's stable. Miles said Cindy might have a lead. But MJ was cautious, she didn't want to lose Peter. Otto was powerful. Look at what he did to you. Miles said that before we didn't have me or Cindy. This time we can work together. We can stop him. Kurt walked in shortly after. Norman Osborne's gone missing. Pete was confused. Miles asked what he meant. Kurt said he checked with Menken. After you called him about Otto, he... He... He what... He took matters into his own hands. I think he's looking for Otto. Peter said he's going to get himself killed. And if we save Harry, he can't have lost both parents. But Miles said they had to go find Otto. Pete said the two of them could track him and tell Cindy to go look for Norman. He told MJ to be his eyes and ears at feast. And he told Kurt that he was in charge of the EMF. They needed to work together, all of them. They were all in agreement as Peter said they have to move. As we got to Pete suited up, he would reprogram his coordinates to match a location. And after a couple of seconds, they got a lock. It looks like Otto's next target is the Investor's Expo in Historia. Peter said they had to move. As they swung over, Cindy would check in, saying she checked Norman's penthouse on Oscorp. No signs of him yet, but she'll keep searching. Peter recalled what it's been like losing Ben. Harry already lost one parent. He can't let him lose another. Miles said that they got this. They soon arrived. Fireworks lit up the skies as we saw they stayed high to get a clear view of the expo. Peter pointed out that there were tons and tons of people here. Miles says he can get them out. Pete said that was a good idea. We can't have any more casualties. But before Miles could actually answer, we began to see malfunctions. The stage exploded from the exposed wires as Peter shouted for Miles to get everyone out of here as Peter tried scoping the place out. He was getting worried. So worried that even his spider sense was in a panic. He was startled by every little thing as Otto was tormenting Peter like this. Suddenly, what looked like a bomb rolled toward Peter, his eyes expanded as he tried to launch it away from the expo. He was caught in a blast. It sent him backward onto the burning stage as we saw the rubble collapsing. We tried to get out, but it got heavier and heavier. Peter had been out the game too long. He was rusty. He shouted for help, but Miles was too far away. Before long, Otto arrived. He leaned in close to Peter. He pleaded and begged for him not to do this. He can kill him. He can take whatever he wants. Just let him save his friend. 
Otto said this isn't about you, Peter. You stopped me from doing what I needed to do. My mission. And I'm gonna finish it. The Osborns of the world are gonna pay. Pete told him that Harry has done nothing wrong. Please. Otto said that it didn't matter. Norman took everything from him. So he's gonna make sure that he rips away everything that he cares about. Before long though, Miles arrived. He used his bioelectricity to shock Otto as he threw him out the way. He tried to help out Peter, but Miles was grabbed by one of Otto's arms as he was thrown around like a ragdoll. Peter was struggling, he was weak. He didn't feel he could do any of this, but then he started listening to the good moments, the memories. And he got the iconic homage to the comics as Peter, trapped under the rubble, remembered what his family and his friends meant to him. As he used that power to lift up the rubble, the theme blasted out at max volume, Spider-Man was back. He shot a web at Otto's tentacles releasing Miles as he dropped him to the floor. Peter got ready for a battle, so it commenced. We fought Otto in a burning expo, the biggest boss of the game thus far. Otto was so much stronger than last time. He had near four stages of fights as we used our surroundings to help us. But Peter wasn't enough. Miles was still knocked out as Peter struck Otto across the face. He ripped off an electrical box as Otto's arm shot right through it, sending a shockwave of electricity down his body. Peter used his time to help on Miles. He said they had to fight. They had to finish this. Miles woke up as Otto disabled the shocks. Miles stood to his feet, side by side with Peter, as Otto got angrier by the second. He told them that they weren't going to get in the way of his plan. Just before we were led into the final fight against him, the spider senses flashed. They looked up. We heard a menacing cackle in the sky. There was nothing to be seen. Even Otto was confused. Miles told Peter to look up. We saw a huge trail of smoke passing through the clouds in the sky, and a luminous green light flashing. Peter asked what the hell this thing was. Otto had no idea. Suddenly, a herd of circular objects were thrown down from above. They looked like pumpkins. Peter was confused. They suddenly exploded. Miles got Peter to safety as we saw Otto caught in a blast. He was coughing, hurt. He tried to get back up. Peter and Miles both watched as we saw something descend from the sky. It looked like a man. He was in some sort of body armor. But Pete was badly hurt and they needed to leave. Miles would help Peter as the two managed to sneak away. But back with Otto, as he was caught off guard, we saw this mysterious person lower into frame. It was, of course, the Green Goblin. He told Otto that he was the one that was going to pay. Otto had no idea who it was as we transferred into the second stage of the boss fight as we played as the Green Goblin, flying around on the glider, throwing pumpkin bombs at Otto, trying to kill him as we saw the pure insanity going through the Goblin's mind. As the fight ended, the Goblin grabbed a hold of Otto by the throat, saying he wasn't as hard to kill as he thought he'd be. Otto laughed, saying he had contingencies. Sure enough, Otto's army of those robotic soldier drones attacked the goblin as Otto made a run for it. Playing as the goblin, we went on a complete rampage, blowing this expo to hell, as goblin ripped their heads off from their bodies and joked about it along the way. As goblin defeated them all, the police and firefighters were near. Goblin sped off on his glider as we heard a menacing laughter. However, as we cut back to Cindy on her hunt for Norman Osborn since he went missing, she found herself entangled in a mystery of her own. Almost a scavenger hunt throughout the city as he ultimately led her down an alleyway in Midtown, which she discovered behind a dumpster was Norman Osborn. He was alive. She called up Miles. She said she found Norman and was going to bring him home. Did you have a look with Otto? Miles said they almost had him, but there's something else, something dangerous. Cindy would ask what it was. But Miles had no idea. He told her to let him know once he had dropped Norman off, and Cindy would place Norman on her shoulder as she swung him back to Oscorp. As they arrived, she asked how he ended up behind that dumpster, and where he's been for the past few days. And he said his memory was foggy. He really doesn't remember. He asked if they managed to get back the antidote. Cindy's expression was enough for Norman to assume the worst. He stormed back inside, slamming the glass door as Cindy sighed. As she perched on the edge of the building, she called Miles and told him that Norman was home and he was safe. He 
Stankta. Him and Pete were about to come up with a strategy if she wanted to come. She said she'd be there. It was time to bring all three of our heroes together as we rounded up at the EMF. Peter, Mary Jane, Miles, Dr. Connors, and Cindy were all there together. Things had gotten messy, complicated. Peter asked if anyone had any idea who that other guy was as they all just shrugged. Miles said to leave it with him. He'll ask around the city, try and get a word on who it is and what they want. MJ said that they still need to find Otto. Kurt said he checked in on Harry. Things are getting worse. His brain's not responding to the treatment. And they said he's not got long left. Peter just paused. How long? Kurt just looked down at the floor. He didn't know what to say. A couple of days tops. This gave Peter a determination. He was shook, but he needed to do this. He said they had to step up their game. He told Cindy she was going to come with him to find Otto. MJ said she'd keep checking online for any leads, and Kurt said he's going to keep a close eye on Harry and Norman. In the meantime, though, Otto was wounded, badly, badly injured, as he made it to the safe house. He tried patching up his wounds as we got a glimpse into the disease that started all of this in the first place. It was consuming him. He knew he didn't have long left, but there was only one thing he knew how to do. Even if it was the last thing he could do, he was going to make Norman watch his son die. Then, once and for all, he'd kill him. And the Osborns can be reunited with their mother in hell. The anti-venom symbiote was still contained with Otto. As he leant over his desk with the map spread out, the only thing that threw him off was this mysterious thing at the expo. He reprogrammed some of his drones to hunt him down as we delve deeper into our final act. We looked up at the board as a red circle around the Brooklyn Bridge as we saw Otto had been working on detonation devices as Otto was going to cause complete chaos, all for revenge that had consumed him. But it was all he had left. But he knew he wouldn't be able to get nowhere near Norman with those damn spiders running around. It was time to destroy them. Otto had set his eyes on the one place that he knew meant everything to Peter. We were cut to Martin Lee at feast. He would be helping out, carrying and moving some boxes, attending to those that needed it. For maybe the first time in his life, Lee finally had a good purpose. It was beautiful to watch this character development, his journey. But it'd be short-lived as Lee heard the ground shaking. He stepped closer toward the entrance. Suddenly, the bombs and explosives were thrown through the window as Lee shouted for everyone to move. And directly mirroring Jefferson Davis, Lee would save a civilian by throwing himself in front of a bomb. The entrance was ripped open by Octavius. He called Lee weak as his claws held him up. Lee told him he wouldn't get away with any of this. Otto said he didn't have to. He laughed as we saw him stab Lee straight through the stomach. The blood poured out onto the ground as Martin Lee died. A hero. His death being a direct homage to the death that sent him on this journey in the first place. But if that death wasn't brutal enough, Otto told his drones to finish the job. As the homeless, the innocent, tried to escape, Otto blew the entire place up, meaning anyone inside wouldn't make it out. Cementing Otto's complete downfall, he was the villain. He was the wickedest of the wicked. The arms had changed him beyond fixing. We were cut to Peter throughout the city. He and Cindy were scouting around, but they kept turning up with nothing. As we had a small side mission alluding to the goblin, Peter was led into a hideout filled with mercenaries dressed in giant pumpkin masks, matching that of the spectacular Spider-Man show. Pete realizes that whoever this goblin person was, he was creating an army. These hideouts and bases were all across the city, but as we completed the mission, Peter got a call. It was from MJ. She was crying, upset as he asked what was wrong. She said she was so, so sorry. Pete got a news alert from the bugle. As he kept reading, his heart hit the ground. Feast was destroyed. Martin Lee, dead. Gloria, they were all gone. Everything that May had built, everything she cared about. Peter was mad, angry beyond explanation. He yelled out as he punched the wall breaking in two. MJ said it was going to be okay. They, they can rebuild. Pete said it's not just that. 
those people. They, they made that place. They were kind hearted people. They did nothing wrong. All they ever wanted was a home. If Otto was after blood, that's what I'm gonna give him. MJ told him not to do anything stupid. He told her he couldn't make any promises. As Peter stood at the foot of the destruction, staring at everything Otto had taken from him. We cut back to Miles as we had some new info on Otto. He tried calling Pete, but there was no answer. Miles said he was just worried about him. Cindy said to just give him some time and space. Right now, we need to focus on arresting this son of a bitch. They went to the Hex's scientific research center in hopes of finding out what the deal was with all these robots and why Otto is using them. Miles and Cindy did some detective work as they discovered more shipments. This time, the supply was bigger, more dangerous, and they were all headed to the Brooklyn Bridge. He needed to let Peter know, but Peter was on his own quest, and he wasn't holding back. Peter would actually get a call from Wraith, who said she had heard about Feast. She said she was sorry. Pete said she didn't need to be, because Otto is going to pay for what he's done. Speaking of which, she actually had a location for him. She sent him some coordinates as we were set to head over to downtown Brooklyn. Peter would swing on over as he found Otto's hideouts. The plans for blowing up the Brooklyn Bridge, all of it were laid out. On the desk though, we saw a picture of Otto and a woman. It was Otto's late wife, Anna Maria. Pete only heard stories about her from his time working with Otto. She died a few years prior. She was his rock, but Otto would always be unstable even before the accident. But this needed to end. As Peter looked around, he found it. The symbiote, locked away in storage as Peter grabbed it. He had a choice. He could either go back and save Harry now, or go after Otto. The bombs may have already been planted. He was between a rock and a hard place, as before long, Otto revealed himself as Peter's choice was taken from him. His disease had made him worse. He was becoming more and more corrupt by the minute, as he told Peter, he hasn't suffered like he has. The two had a conversation that hit deep. Peter said, you have no idea what I've lost. My parents, Uncle Ben, Aunt May, Harry, and you. You took everything left in this world that I cared about. And for that, I'm going to make sure that you go back behind bars and you never see the sunrise again. Peter attached the symbiote canister to his back as we were led into our next boss. The first stage took place in the hideout as we were absolutely ripping the place apart. The entire structure collapsed as Otto grabs Peter. They leapt through the window as they threw each other around like ragdolls across the city before they finally arrived at the Brooklyn Bridge. Otto said the final chapter has already been written. This is where it ends for the both of them. After he's taken care of Peter, he can kill Norman and then all of this will be over. Peter said he wasn't going to let that happen. This boss fight was unique as it was a race against the clock. The bombs were ticking as we needed to stop Otto before they blew. It was difficult, it was tough, but we kept fighting. We got hit, but we got back up. We kept fighting. Spider-Man does not quit. Otto ripped him to shreds, his mask half ripped, hung off his face, his wrist broken. Peter was beat, but he wouldn't let Otto win. He kept fighting. Otto grabbed Peter by the throat as he threw him to the ground. Peter fell headfirst to the concrete as he just laid there. He told Peter he was sorry, truly, but he knew this was coming. There was only one person now that he had to kill, and just as he said that, Otto was impaled straight through the back. He yelled out in pain and in anger. His body was thrown to the ground as we saw the goblin rise into frame. He told Otto he never had the guts to kill him. Otto died as the goblin just stood there and laughed. He wiped the blood from the blades of his glider as Peter looked back up. He stood back to his feet as he stared at Otto's body. He couldn't believe he was really dead. A part of him realizes now that he didn't actually want to kill Otto. He just wanted to make him pay. This led Peter to fight the goblin for the first time. But we could tell that Peter was weak. He still got a few good hits in. As Peter kept up his guard, he struck goblin across the jaw as we saw his mask fall to the ground. We panned up slowly as we saw Norman Osborne. Peter was shell-shocked. Norman just smacked. Peter tried to attack, but Norman would disappear. Peter fell to his knees. He leaned over Otto's body as he just screamed. The anger, the hatred. He didn't even have the chance to end this by his own accord. It was taken from him. But then Peter remembered the symbiote. 
He had to get it back to Harry, especially before Norman gets back. Peter, bloody, broken and defeated, limped his way back through the city, stumbling, falling and failing with each swing as he finally made it to the penthouse. He screamed MJ's name as he fell to the ground. Both Kurt and MJ ran toward him. MJ attended to Peter as Kurt grabbed the symbiote. Miles told him to take care of Harry. Miles would lift Peter and carry him into the room as he took off his mask. It was in a claustrophobic one-take scene as Peter was fighting for his life. Harry was doing the same. Kurt set up the machines as he opened up the canister. The symbiote started to crawl around Harry's body before eventually beginning the bonding process. Meanwhile, Peter was being comforted by Miles and MJ as he told them Otto had died. It was... it was... Peter tried to get his words out, but he couldn't. Miles asked who he was talking about as Norman stepped through the door. He asked what was going on. We saw Peter, maskless. He finally knew he was Spider-Man. We saw Harry on the table, kicking and screaming. The symbiote was trying to bond with him. Miles told him to relax. Norman told him to get that thing off of him right now. The tensions rose as Peter tried to get out that Norman was the goblin, but he just couldn't. All of a sudden, Harry's vitals just stopped. He began to flatline as Kurt panicked. He tried to fix this. Norman screamed and shouted, but it was too late. Harry was gone. Norman turned back to the Spider-Men in pure anger. Miles told him to calm down. This wasn't Pete's fault. He grabbed Miles by the head as he slammed his head into the coffee table. NJ gasped in shock as Norman pressed the button on his watch as we saw the goblin suit wrap around his body. That's, that's what Peter tried to tell them. He grabbed Peter as he pinned him down, slamming his back against the shattered glass. He punched him again and again. MJ tried to stop him, but he hit MJ backward. Peter was dying. Then, suddenly, we cut back to Harry's hand as we saw it twitch. His eyes shot open as the symbiote completely wrapped around him. The bonding had been completed. As Harry became Agent anti -Vedum. he shot off the table as he grabbed his dad with a symbiote tendril and threw him into a wall. He ran straight over to Pete as his mask unraveled. Pete couldn't stop smiling. Harry was alive. Harry just fell into Pete's arms. They started crying as he told Pete he was so thankful that he didn't give up hope on him. Pete said never. They were brothers. He'd never give up on him. MJ started crying in happiness. <laughs> They're friends. They were finally back together. But soon enough, Norman woke up. He stared deep into his son's eyes. He tried to tell Norman he was going to be okay, but the look of disapproval on his face said it all. Look at what they turned you into. Norman would place his hands on his mask as he pulled it down. Peter and Miles were down, as Harry told MJ to get all of them out of here as soon as possible. As we played as Harry as Agent Anti-Venom, as he had to fight Norman, his own father. This battle was emotional, rough, the hardest of them all. We got to experience the symbiote abilities once more as we saw Harry's redemption. He had the best version of the symbiote and he was going to do what he had always set out to do. But Norman was shouting, screaming that this wasn't right and Harry was no longer his son. The serum that the goblin had took had just completely taken over his mind. Harry showed how powerful he was as he defeated Norman, but he wouldn't go down that easy. He vanished yet again before Harry's eyes. He stood there, shocked, confused, as MJ shouted for Harry's help. Using the symbiote, Harry was able to get Peter, Miles, MJ, and Kurt all to safety. MJ told them to take them to the EMF. They'd be safe there, as we had a moment to just calm down for a second. They arrived at the EMF. Before long, Peter and Miles woke up, not so long after each other, as Pete asked if he was okay. Miles said it was good. As Peter sat up, he looked in front of him took off his mask as we saw the smile contrast the bruises and cuts on his face as Harry was sat there on the table as Kurt was doing the final checks. Pete stood to his feet. He was weak as MJ would help him. Harry stood up as he tried to give Peter a helping hand as Peter just fell into his arms. A heartwarming moment. Peter thought he had lost him forever. Harry said he wasn't going anywhere. Miles told him this is where he belonged, with his friends. Harry walked over to Miles. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry, Miles, for everything that happened. I can't thank you enough for what you did to save me. I hope someday we can be friends. Miles smiled. I thought we were already friends, man. The two shook hands as Harry smiled. 
MJ would have smiled too as she realized, asking where Cindy was. Harry confusingly asked who Cindy was, as Pete said there was quite a bit of catching up they needed to do. Like this place. Peter said he never stopped believing in their dream. He wasn't just going to let it die. Harry was proud. Thankful. They got their second chance to do things right this time. But with Norman out there, nothing was certain. Harry would ask what the hell happened. Pete said after, you know, what happened with Venom. He started to blame us. He hated us. But he just wanted to make you better. Miles said he took a serum that was meant for you. It was labelled a performance enhancer, but the test just must not have been accurate. Pierce says it's messing with his mind. They need to stop him. A lot's happened in the last few days. Pete was still trying to process the loss of Otto. Harry would ask what would happen. Pete told him that Norman killed him. Right in front of him. MJ said they needed a plan. There's more of them now than ever before. Norman's not holding back. After what happened at Feast, Harry stopped. What do you mean, Feast? What happened? Pete looked upset. Miles told him that Otto blew it up. And he killed Martin Lee. Harry said he was so sorry. Pete said it'd be okay. Because they were going to put an end to this. Tonight. Soon enough, though, Cindy would arrive. Pete introduced her to Harry as she hugged him and said she was so glad he was feeling better. Harry smiled. But she told him it wasn't safe, they needed to get him out of here. Harry would then bring out the suit, leaving nothing but his head exposed as Cindy gasped. Miles said that this new suit was pretty cool. MJ smiled at them. The real spider team, all four of them. Harry jokingly called them the Spider Pals. Peter nodded, saying it was a good name. That's when Kurt walked in. He looked frantic. Harry asked him what was going on as Kurt said Norman's power. He revisited an old serum we worked on years ago. It was unfaithful, dangerous. It took months of convincing him to drop it before he would. It makes sense it'd be the first reserve. Pete asked if there was any way of creating an antidote. Kurt was skeptical. Harry put his hand on Kurt's shoulder. He said that no matter what happens, Norman was still his father. They need to save him. Cindy says that everyone does deserve a second chance. Isn't that right, Pete? It took him a second to answer, but he agreed. MJ asked what their play was, as they all looked at Peter. He jokingly asked why they were all looking at him. Miles said that he was the OG, and Harry says that it's because they trust him. Pete took a deep breath. Okay. Well, unlike Otto or Craven, Norman isn't after anything specific. Cindy said that he wants us. Miles says he's under the impression we ruined Harry. Pete said that gives them the advantage. He's coming to us. Let's pick somewhere isolated from the city. We draw him there. He'll come for Harry. And we work together to stop him. Kurt can develop an anti-serum. And MJ said she's going to get people to safety. Pete said it's going to be dangerous. But he trusts her. They all looked at each other. A small moment to show how far the spider team had evolved. From just Peter Parker, to the inclusion of Miles, to Cindy, to now Harry Osborn. They were more than a team. More than friends. They were family. And family stand up for each other. They protect each other. Harry said they had each other's backs. Kurt said he'd call them when he had the cure. He told them to use this time wisely. Gather any equipment, tech that you'll need, and we'll stop this. Peter said it sounded like a plan. We had one final mission with each of our spider team before the final battle. First with Miles, he headed home. Rio was there waiting as Miles just stumbled in. Rio would help him to the couch. She would ask him if he was okay. Miles just hugged her. He said thank you. Thank you for always being there for me. For supporting me. Thank you for being my mum. Everything you do for me, I, I, I appreciate it. Rhea was brought to tears. She held Miles' hand. She said it was Miles that she should thank. After Jeff, I'd have fallen apart if not for you. Miles said the last like both of them would have. But they had each other. They always will. But what's about to go down? He doesn't want to see anyone else. He cares about getting hurt. He just wants this to be over. 
so he can come home and be with his family. Rio said that was sweet, but Miles has two families, and right now, they need you, more than ever before. And she believes that Miles is strong enough to overcome any obstacles in his path. Miles said nothing. He paused and smiled at Rio. He told her he loved her and that he was so glad to have her. It was a wonderfully wholesome moment. We were then cut to Cindy. She was swinging across the city as she got a call from Albert. He was asking where she had been and why she wasn't picking up the phone. She said she got a bit caught up. And she's sorry. She's been getting caught up quite a lot lately. She hasn't been making any time to spend with him. And that's going to change. After all this is over, they should go get some ice cream. Maybe down at Central Park where mum used to take us. Albert said he'd like that. He told her to be careful. And he loved her. She said she loved him too. And that everything was going to be okay. As we got to Harry. He went back to his mother's grave. He fell to his knees, mirroring the scene from the last game as he told Emily that everything was going to be okay now. He's going to save dad. And that everything was going to go back to normal. Back to how it was. Me and Pete we're going to do what you always dreamed of. And we're going to do it for you. For Aunt May. He ran his hand across her name. He looked up to the night sky, appreciating the stars that he was thankful to be living under as we cut to Pete. He'd be with Mary Jane. They both sat on the porch at May's house. Peter gave time for his body to heal as the two of them reflected on their story. Pete recalled the first time he asked MJ out. How nervous he was. MJ remembers how oddly sweaty he was when he did. He smiled. He looked at MJ with a smile. These last few years have been crazy. And I know we've had our ups and downs, but thank you. Thank you for always staying with me. For putting up with me. So grateful for you. MJ said there's no one she'd rather be with. There is no one that could ever make her feel the way that Peter does. And he the same. He looked off at the street. As he said, retiring, it feels right now. I mean, look at the rest of those guys. The best people I could have ever dreamed of working with. MJ asked if Peter thinks they'll be okay without him. They're going to be just fine. Besides... Me and Harry are going to have a lot of work to do. MJ agreed. Pete said that he and MJ also had a lot of work to do. MJ was confused. With the house? He looked away from her. No. It's going to be a crazy couple of weeks planning the wedding. There was a long pause. He looked back to MJ as her face lit up. What? Pete grabbed her hand. I love you, Mary Jane. I love you so much. You mean everything to me. And I want to spend the rest of my life with you. So, will you marry me? MJ got up. She just gave him the biggest hug. She brought down into tears of joy as Peter said he'd take that as a yes. The two kissed, sharing a beautiful, passionate moment. Our Peter was growing up. He was ready to take on the next chapter of his life. However, he got a call. As he answered it, we saw all four of our heroes on screen. As Kurt told him it was time. The entire city was now overrun with Norman's personal pumpkin henchmen. The streets were in fear, as it was left to one group of remarkable people to save them. The entire team swung together for the first time as we saw them arrive at Oscorp's biggest power plant. Pete told them to set up around the perimeter, and now that they just have to wait. Harry had to ask though, how would his dad know that they're here? Pete told him not to worry. We cut to MJ as she walked into the bugle as she told Jameson what was happening as he told him to get it on the air right now. We cut back to the team. They were ready to fight. But as they waited, we had a moment that was similar to the interaction in No Way Home, where all the spiders just talk about their experiences. Cool interactions and moments. As Peter broke the news about him and MJ, Harry said he was so happy for them. So was Miles. But the happiness was short-lived, as sooner rather than later, the Goblin was here. This led us to our final big boss fight of the game. Goblin was the most powerful of them all. 
we had six stages of this fight. We first controlled P. The rest of the team still attacked, but this time it was about working together and coordinating the attacks. Norman was absolutely furious. The serum had completely melted his mind. He was sickened at the idea of what Harry had become. He just wanted his son to be like him. We took control of Miles for the third stage. The electric powers gave us a better chance, but it still wasn't enough. Peter told the others that if they're going to win this fight, some of them are going to have to lose it. Cindy was confused, but Miles knew exactly what Peter meant. Both him and Cindy would take the reactor. If they can shut it down in time, I can stop Norman's energy from feeding into his power. Meanwhile, Peter and Harry will keep him distracted. As the final stages commenced, we played as both Peter and Harry constantly switching between the two, as Norman's two sons fighting him, trying to stop him. He felt the trick. He said he took Peter in after his uncle died. He gave him love. He gave him opportunities. Now all he wants to do is to throw it back in his face. Harry told him not to listen. It wasn't true. The emotions ramped up as Miles shouted saying they'd shut off the reactor. He told them to get down here. They both swung in as Peter, Cindy and Miles wrapped their webs around Norman trying to hold him back. But he was trying to rip them off. Harry had to make a decision. Let his father live to become the monster. Or finally put an end to this. Pete told Harry to hurry as we saw him walk over to Norman, his father, his dad. He wrapped the symbiote around his chest as he tried to use the anti-venom abilities to banish the goblin serum long enough. Norman was weakened as Peter threw Harry the antidote. Harry shot out the tendril to catch it as he stabbed it in Norman's neck. Norman was confused, almost as if the goblin was another personality in total. Peter fell to his knees as the others were out of breath. Norman asked what the hell was going on. Harry, what are you? Harry stopped him by wrapping his arms around him, giving him a passionate hug. Norman just broke down, telling Harry that he was so sorry for everything. He loved him. He just wanted him to be okay. Harry said he was sorry too, but he tried walking away. Norman shouted, telling Harry to get back here. He wasn't done with him. Harry walked over to Pete as Pete placed his arm around him and he told him it was going to be okay. Norman begged, kicked and screamed for them to come back and to finish the job as we saw the spiders pick Harry up. As they walked away, as a team, soon enough the cops would arrive. Norman was arrested as the Goblin Saga, the Osborne Saga, was finally over. We faded to two months later. The epilogue was a lift in a raise of spirits. This is the ending we've waited so long for. Norman was placed behind bars for the murder of Otto and the rest of the heinous crimes that he did. Peter finally retired, for good this time, knowing that the city was safe with Harry, Miles and Cindy. He trusted them. The EMF was back and bigger than ever, as Pete and Harry were able to realize their dream, as we saw the trees Aunt May and Emily planted blossom throughout the city. Miles graduated college as he was ready to take on the next chapter of his life. He and Haley had never been happier, as Rio couldn't be prouder. Cindy finally went for that day out with her father, as it was a nice scene, a sweet one. As our final moment of this franchise was the wedding of Peter Parker. And just because he could, good old Pickle Puss himself, J. Jonah Jameson, would be the priest marrying them. As Peter stared deep into Mary Jane's beautiful eyes, the moment he's dreamed of ever since he first laid eyes on her. The two kissed. Harry and Miles were both of Peter's best men as we saw Cindy as the maid of honour. The crowd cheered, as we, the player, felt nothing but heart warmth and love. But the tension would soon be broken as we heard sirens in the distance. Harry gave Peter a look as Peter smiled at him. We got an epic final swinging sequence with Harry, Miles and Cindy, the new spider team of New York, the Spider Pals. The theme blasted at max volume as we cut back to Peter and MJ. They shared one final glance at each other. As they kissed, we faded to black as the game ended.